I might make a point here that's not specifically about engineering, but the kind of job that engineering is, and we could talk more broadly about something like coal mining in uh, the Northeast too. These were skilled jobs. They were jobs that had social status attached to them. Um, they were hard jobs and they were brutal jobs, but they were respected and they were seen as contributing something vital to the functioning of the country, the region. That really stands in contrast to the kind of jobs that we're seeing increasingly now. There is not the same level of skill and social dignity that is attached to working in a call centre. There is not the respect and validation that comes from what delivering for Deliveroo. And so when we talk about the importance of something like uh, engineering to a region like this, you know, the irony here is that, that nowadays identity is even more bound up with one's uh, career, with one's job, than it was back in the age when uh, coal mining, the shipping industries were everything. We've, we've pushed all these other points of identities that gives people's life value ever further out of the picture. So things like hobbies, family attachments, we have less time for them, they're, 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 they're more socially illegitimate in the sense that they're not really the basis of respect or of income in any means. And that'll sit on the top of the fact that, that the kinds of work that people are doing now, nowadays uh, at a very point when identity is so bound up with professional identity, the jobs that people are doing don't give that degree of participation in society. They don't feel like they're contributing something of any significance. So one of the things that I think is really interesting about the common room, if you go back to uh, mining communities or worker-based communities of any kind throughout the 19th century, they always had these community hubs that functioned as places of learning, places of knowledge exchange. There was a really brilliant tradition of something like the Amateur University, the, the little room where people could come together for events and make use of community facilities. Um, when you've got employment that's no longer based around those collective identities, people doing the same kind of jobs. When those jobs no longer afford that kind of identity or when the kind of work that people are doing is uh, dispersed all over the place so that the employer no longer provides some kind of uh, meaningful hub, you don't get that possibility of, of coming together, of learning from one another and of an associating it, uh, to the same extent. And so you do get this fragmentation, this dissipation of the kind of com community structure that the common room is reinstating. So, and that too becomes the base of something like a, a local identity. Uh, you know, people nowadays, I think especially younger generations, they, a lot of their identity, especially if you've not got the kind of jobs or prospects that uh, fill you with some sense of a future that is being built, fill, fill you with some sense of a future that you can build for yourself, the attachments that you've got become the attachments that define your heritage and your past. If that becomes some kind of dead memory that you've got no access to, um, it doesn't work. So you know, even if there's not a great lot of prospects career-wise, uh, in some of these areas nowadays, the fact that you've still got the, the remnants of the communities, these points that, that provided the hubs and the basis for, for community participation, that can still give something a lot to, to the, the, the families, the descendants of the people who were very much a part of this local culture. I've been involved in uh, a couple of projects that uh, get local communities involved in recreating their industrial heritage by, for example, using something like Minecraft to build up what their city was like in the 19th century before it came along and got repressed by the identical semiotics of your, your typical failing uh, UK high street. And so you can get school children uh, 
getting some possibility of participating in a building of the city that they don't otherwise get to, to be involved with. And actually, one of the things that's really amazing about a, a building like this one is that you come to it and you really get that sense in which, in its heyday, Durham was the collective work produced by its workers. It wasn't just uh, a, a city that is set in place by your uh, large commercial manufacturers setting up these shops that the community's got no role in uh, helping to plan or, or helping design itself around. Here we get a sense of uh, the city is built by the people who worked in it. And if, if that conveys anything, it comes back to this idea that we want to reignite some sense of people actively being able to participate in the building of the communities that they live in. It's a very uh, kind of castrated sense in which we live now where we think that these environments that we inhabit, we just get plonked into them and we adapt to them. We don't, we don't get that chance of carving ourselves out a world. Uh, we simply have to fit to what's already been shoved in front of us. So coming back and seeing that there was a time when people actively got to participate in the construction of their surroundings, this is what makes us realise that it's still possible. I was quite struck earlier looking at the new motto of the Red Hills project. Uh, the past we inherit, the future we build. Um, I think we really tend to forget the fact that the future doesn't automatically exist. We, so certainly among uh, philosophers, we might differentiate the kind of, uh, the, the kind of future that is no future at all. It's just an endless present that entropically stretches out and involves no kind of rupture with what's already there. This is the future of somebody who turns up to work every day, the same miserable job, no prospects, no future. The alternative to that is actively building yourself a future that comes from uh, having options, having possibilities, being able to use the technology of the age to construct uh, an alternative to the world that you were born into. What we find with uh, the Miners Hall is an instance of people having done exactly that in the 19th century. And it kind of reawakens that possibility now at a very time when the dominant forms of work that are being offered up really offer nothing but adaptation to uh, a given environment, that don't offer this possibility of, of constructing the world in which you live through work. Uh, the increasing emphasis of the contemporary economy is that you just bend to fit what's there. You move to where there's work, you work the hours that, that you get offered, you accept the kind of salaries uh, that, or, or wages that are being uh, forced on you. But the world of work doesn't have to be that way, and there are plenty of points in history when it hasn't been like that. And the origins of, hall is, of, of this hall is one of those moments. Each time you get something like a technological revolution, you get a reorganization of society around the new technology. You saw it in the age of the shift from oral to written society. You saw it in the age of the shift from uh, reading only amongst the upper classes to working class literature in the 18th and 19th century. If uh, you're one of those generations that, that, that gets kind of pushed to the margins when the new technology comes along, you can become a victim of uh, a really a kind of intergenerational crisis. You know, the way that we work is that older generations teach, train younger generations in the participation of the world. What you get when there's a skills crisis, and we saw this completely in the 1980s when all the, the, the miners were losing their jobs in the 90s too, is that you've suddenly got young generations who can use the computers, who can use digital technology, and older generations get left behind. This leads to one kind of social crisis, an, an intergenerational crisis, 
but we get other kinds of crisis too. If technology is developing at such a rapid rate that not even the young are in a position where they're constantly able to be taught and educated in, in the tools that organize society. And the differences this, that this makes is one between passivified uh, consumption and the active ability to participate in society. If all you can do with your iPad is sit there and gulp at YouTube all day long, you can consume, but you cannot actively participate in the construction of the world. You cannot uh, build yourself a future that breaks with uh, the present and constructs you some alternative way of living. That is the very root of the skills gap. You can't participate in society if you're not able actively to use uh, the, the technologies around which society is organized to, uh, to, to contribute as much as you take from it. The function of, uh, of a hub, like the common room, is uh, to ensure that that possibility of participation and meaningful world building is there. But I'd add that it's not the only significant thing here. We tend to put uh, so much emphasis on uh, the skills gap as if it's the only factor that matters in, in uh, the, the constant shifting of technology. You can have people who are more than capable of using computers to code and stuff, and that doesn't stop them from being permanently stressed out and overworked and exhausted. So uh, filling the skills gap to enable people to participate in on more meaningful, uh, dignifying and dignified forms of work is one thing, but you kind of need to address the broader culture of work as well to make sure that people just aren't being burned to exhaustion by it. <laughs>